Tonight's Visakha Puja, the full moon in May. The tradition is that when the Buddha was born on the full moon in May, and 35 years after that he gained awakening on the full moon in May, and 45 years after that he passed away into total nirvana on the full moon in May. So we're celebrating three events. What we did just now is called a misa bucha. We're paying homage with material things, flowers, candles, incense. Now it's time for bhati bhati bucha, paying homage to the practice. On the night of his passing away, the Buddha said that this was the true way to pay homage to him. The devas were sprinkling flowers down from heaven, according to the text, playing music sprinkling incense. And the Buddha told the monks, this is not how you appropriately pay respect to the Tathagata. You pay respect by practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, which elsewhere he explains as meaning practicing for the sake of disenchantment, from disenchantment for dispassion, and for dispassion practice for release. Of the three events, the, the awakening is the one that's easiest to relate to. It's the one that's told in most detail, and it's told from the Buddha's own point of view. The passing away, of course, is told by what other people remember. His birth is told in very short terms. What he remembers of it, he was mindful and alert as he entered his mother's womb, mindful and alert when he was born. But the really interesting and useful things have to do with his awakening. This is why when they say that you have conviction in the Buddha, it's conviction in his awakening. Because this is the most relevant to the problem that we're facing. As he said when he first went out into the wilderness, he saw that he was subject to aging, illness, and death. And he wanted to find something that was not subject to aging, illness, and death. That's pretty audacious. Most people say, well, you have to accept the fact that aging is going to come, illness will come, death will come. But he didn't accept that. He said, these things will come, but there must be something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. This means two things. One, you find this, and when aging, illness, and death come, there's no suffering. And after your final death, you experience a dimension that's free from these things. You'll never have to experience them again. And so it's because of his desire for what goes beyond death that we have the Dharma. Think about that. Someone who desired something that radical and was able to find it. They say that on the night of his awakening there was an earthquake, and it does quake the earth. When you start thinking about how the fact there is something that doesn't age, grow ill, and die, and it can be found through human effort. This is why conviction in the Buddha's awakening is relevant to the practice, it leads to persistence, leads to mindfulness, concentration, discernment. This is relevant to us, because the Buddha's message was he found it and we can find it too. On the night of his awakening, he Learn some important insights. After getting the mind into solid concentration, he turned the power of that concentration to the question, is death the end, or is it something that happens after death? At that point, there were a lot of people with lots of different ideas on this issue. Some said that death was a total wipeout. Others said that you died, but you stayed the same. You came back in the same, the same status. You've been a Brahmin before, you're going to be a Brahmin again. You've even been a dog before, you'll be a dog again. Others said that you changed. And the Buddha, as he turned his mind to this question, just began to remember his many previous lifetimes, stretching way back many, many aeons. He saw that he had changed, 
radically. Sometimes he'd been in hell, sometimes he'd been up in the highest heavens. But wherever he went, it was impermanent. It wouldn't last. You'd die and you'd come back again. Then the question was, well, why so many different levels? Was there a pattern? So in the second watch of the night, he turned his mind, the power of his concentration, to that question. He saw beings all over the cosmos dying and being reborn, in line with their actions. Their actions were their intentions. Their intentions were informed by their views, and their views were informed by the, the people they listened to, the people they respected. This is why in his later teachings he put so much emphasis on finding admirable friends, people who have right view, because that will influence the course of your life. But then he looked further. As he said, his memory of past lifetimes went back much further than anybody else. There had been people who would remember previous lifetimes. But because their memory was limited, they came to some wrong views. Some saw people doing unskillful things and then going to hell in the next lifetime, doing skillful things and going to heaven in the next lifetime. And they taught that what you did was totally determining where, where you're going to go. You do something bad, you're going to go down. You do something good, you're going to go up. Other people saw cases where people did something unskillful, but then went to heaven. Other people did things that were skillful, but went to hell. So those people said, your actions had no bearing at all on your next rebirth. So the Buddha looked into the issue. And he saw that things were not as simple as all that. Both sides were too simplistic. He saw there were cases where people did skillful things and went to heaven. It wasn't just because of one or two skillful things. It was because of what they did afterwards as well. And also the state of mind at death. They held on to right view. There are cases where people did unskillful things, and then more unskillful things after that, and at the moment of death held on to wrong view. That pulled them down. But there were cases where people did skillful things in this life. But then they, their minds switched. As the Buddha once said, the, the mind is very quick to reverse itself. Either they did more unskillful things, or they developed a wrong view at the moment of death, and that pulled them down. Other people had done unskillful things, but then later on they changed. At the moment of death they developed a right view, and that pulled them up. Now the results of their unskillful actions were not totally wiped out. It simply meant that they were delayed. But in the delay, these people had the opportunity to develop more skill in the next lifetime, some to the point where they could weaken greatly the the bad results of the previous actions. But the lesson he learned here was the power of the present moment, that moment of death, could totally change the course of your life, depending on the views you had at that point. This is why when we meditate we're focusing on the present moment, what we're doing right here, right now. Not because the present moment is a wonderful place to hang out. But because the present moment has power. If you're alert, mindful, ardent in what you're doing in the present moment, you can have an impact right now on the amount of suffering or lack of suffering you have. So this is how the Buddha's awakening is relevant to us. Because from there he went on to look into his own mind in the present moment. For the third knowledge was what ended the effluence. In other words, the outflows of the mind that keep the mind going in this process of death and rebirth and redeath and rebirth. He saw that if he understood things in terms of four noble truths and followed the, the duties appropriate to each of those truths, he could go beyond birth and aging and illness and death entirely. 
that the first noble truth was the truth of suffering. He saw that suffering isn't just pain, it's clinging. We cling to the form of the body, we cling to our feelings, we cling to our perceptions, our thought constructs, our consciousness. And in that clinging is the suffering. And why do we cling? We cling because of craving. And if you can comprehend the suffering to the point where you go beyond any passion, aversion, and delusion around it, and if you can abandon the craving, that's the end of suffering. That was the third noble truth. And the fourth noble truth is what you do. Everything from right view to right concentration. It boils down to virtue, concentration, and discernment. These are the qualities that allow you to abandon your cravings if you do them right. You practice virtue to get some control over your cravings, and also to get sensitive to what the mind is thinking, what its intentions are when it acts. Ultimately, people go through life and they don't pay attention to their intentions. They just go on their urges. And if you ask them, why did you do that? Sometimes they can't say. But when you practice virtue, you have to be very clear about what your intentions are, because those make the difference between whether you're going to be able to maintain the precepts or not. Concentration, again, is a way of getting some control over the mind. Focus it on one object. Try to find a sense of ease and well-being with that object, like the breath. Breathe in ways that give rise to pleasure, give rise to rapture. Breathe in ways that you can be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out, and spread that sense of pleasure and rapture throughout the whole body. And then you can still the effect of that pleasure and rapture. You can even still the breath. When the body gets really quiet like this, then you can see the mind a lot more clearly. And you begin to see, this is how an intention forms, this is how a craving forms. And this is the mind here, how the mind is in collusion with its unskillful states. And this is how you can get it to so it doesn't want to fall in with unskillful states again. That's how concentration leads to discernment. as you really fall in line with the duties of the Four Noble Truths. So the Buddha said he completed those duties, and that was his awakening. In other words, he saw the regularity of the Dhamma, and then beyond that is something called unbinding. That's the dimension where there is no aging, no illness, no death. That's when the earth quaked. And the Buddha, who had, up to that point, had been the Bodhisattva, and he was now the Buddha, he was now the awakened one. The story continues that he stayed around the tree under which he had gained awakening, the Bodhi tree, for seven weeks, experiencing the bliss of release before he started teaching. And we're fortunate that he decided to teach. Once he'd gained awakening, he was indebted to no one. And he could have not taught if, if that he had made that choice. In fact, he was even thinking of not teaching. The story goes that Brahma got upset and seeing what was going on in the Buddha's mind. He came down and knelt down on one knee. He said, please teach there are those with little dust in their eyes, they will understand the Dharma. The Buddha reflected on that. He realized it was true, and that it would be worthwhile to teach. So we're fortunate that he did, otherwise we would never have known what had happened that night. But he did teach. He taught the Four Noble Truths. He taught all the things we need to know. He showed that it is possible. This big issue in life, the fact that we're all going to die, most people don't want to think about it. Or well, their attitude is, well, if we're going to die, let's grab as much fun, grab as much power, grab as much whatever as we can before. But then it's going to be torn from our grasp. It's a miserable attitude to have. He showed one that death is not annihilation. 
It's followed by rebirth, dependent on your craving. But craving is not reliable. As you said, you could live a good life and then have a sudden switch at the moment of death, develop a wrong view, and it'll pull you down. So you really need to train the mind so it can get to the point where it knows that it will not be pulled down. When you've had your first glimpse of the deathless, you know that what the Buddha taught was true. He really didn't know what he's talking about. It is something outside of space, outside of time. So nothing can touch it. Once you've seen that, the Buddha says, the amount of suffering left to you is much less than it was before. There was one time when he reached down and picked up a little dirt under his fingernail and asked the monks, which is greater, the amount of dirt in the earth or the amount of dirt under his fingernail? And the monks said, oh, of course, it's the amount of dirt in the earth is much greater. The Buddha said in the same way, for someone who has seen the deathless, the amount of suffering left over is the dirt under the fingernail. If you haven't seen the deathless, the possibility of suffering is as great as the earth. So these are things we should think about as we think about the Buddha's awakening, what he's shown about the truths of birth and death, the truths of what is beyond birth and beyond death, and the possibility that we, too, can find the deathless. It's because of the audacity of his desire. The fact that he remained undaunted. He tried many different ways, and he didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. He tried formless states, hanging out there, he realized that was not the answer. He tried self-torture, that was not the answer. Six years of self-torture. Imagine his dedication. That was not the answer. But he didn't give up. It's because he was audacious and undaunted. And that's why we have the Dharma. So think about all the trouble he went through to find that, and have a sense of its value, how precious it is. Because it's not the case that the Dharma is always available for people to, to listen to and to practice. During times when the Buddha's teachings have been forgotten, other people have to find it all on their own, go through all those difficulties. So here the Dharma is available. And it shows that there is a way out. And this is what it means to have conviction in the Buddha's awakening. We're convinced in the Buddha. We're convinced in the Dharma that he taught. But as he says, conviction is really true only when you act on it. So this is why we practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. The Dharma as it's taught, the Dharma for the sake of disenchantment, dispassion, release. That's how we pay homage to the Buddha. We pay homage to our own desire for true happiness. Most people go through life and their desire for happiness gets beaten down, beaten down. They say, you have to learn how to accept this limitation, you've got to learn how to accept that, accept that limitation. And the Buddha again was defiant, no. There must be something that doesn't die. His desire to find that is what gives us the Dharma. And he's encouraging us to have the same desire. We hear so much that the Buddha was against craving. And it's true, he said three types of craving. Craving for sensuality, for becoming and non-becoming. Those cause suffering. But the desire to be skillful, which is the desire that drove him on his path, drove him all the way to the deathless. That's part of the path. To try to nurture that and focus it on the causes. Virtue, concentration, discernment, and the result, which is release. Can be yours. <laughs>